Europe has been through a period of great change over the last 70 years. After World War II, much of the continent was left devastated and there was widespread desire for lasting peace so that Europe would never again witness war on such a scale. The process that started back then led to the formation of the common market, which in turn became the European Union. Today we tell you the stories of some of these momentous events as we present Europe from World War II to today's European Union. economic and political partnership between 27 different countries. It has around half a billion citizens and its combined economy represents about 20% of the world's total. It gives European countries a place to talk. You know, for most of our history, we've been fighting things out on the battlefield. So it's really important that we have a, a single forum where we can all get together, sit around the table and fight these things out with words rather than with bullets and bombs. Taken together, the EU is the world's largest economic grouping. It accounts for about 20% of all uh, global trade. Um, it has got a considerable share of the largest multinational corporations in, in the world, and it has got many of the most developed countries in the world. The EU we know today works as a single market, with free movement of people, goods and services from one country to another. There's a standardised system of laws, and most of the EU's countries now share a common currency, the Euro. Many of the countries have also signed up to the Schengen Agreement, which means they no longer have border controls or passport checks between member states. The EU often speaks as one voice, representing all its member countries at the UN or the World Trade Organization. And it has developed a sophisticated regulatory structure. This is the European Parliament in Brussels. Although the EU has no official capital, in practical terms, Brussels has acquired that status. Here, you'll also find other important EU institutions, such as the European Commission and the European Council. But there is also a Parliament building in Strasbourg, and to find the European Central Bank, you'll need to go to Frankfurt. The location of these buildings owes much to the nature of the European Union itself. For the past 50 years, nobody could decide where to put the European Parliament, the European Bank and so on. So they've kind of fudged it. They've found political solutions which have not really suited everybody, but they're the sort of least worst scenario. The EU we know today is a vibrant community, but its origins can be traced back to events that dominated the 20th century, to the legacy of World War II. This was how Europe looked in 1945. The continent's economic structure was ruined and millions of people were homeless. Widespread devastation meant that many were starving and freezing to death. All of the transport systems had been completely bombed. In France, they only had a quarter of the trains that they'd had at the beginning of the war. In, in Italy, they destroyed a third of the road network. So, Although the Allies were sending in a lot of food, they couldn't really distribute it to the places where it was needed most. For example, in the French zone of Germany, people were living on 800 calories a day, all the way through 1946. Now, you can't survive healthily on those sort of rations. Many people believed that some form of European integration would prevent the extreme forms of nationalism that had caused the war and the resulting devastation. The genius of the people who decided to create the European Union was that they saw that it was nationalism that had created the Second World War in the first place. So they wanted to promote a more integrated society where people wouldn't have to fight each other. They promoted the idea of trade because of course if you're trading with one another you have to have a dialogue. 
Industrial production in 1945 was considerably lower than it had been in 1938. Agricultural production was similarly devastated. And of course, there was a considerable number of people who didn't have jobs, who didn't have employment. So the economies were in a bad way. Out of that, in effect, there was a desire to find a new way, not just for peace and security, but in a new way to build these economies in the future. The first steps to achieving European integration happened at the Potsdam Conference of 1945. The participants at the Potsdam Conference decided that Germany and its capital Berlin should be divided into four zones. They were to be controlled by Britain, France, the USA and the Soviet Union. And under the terms of the Potsdam Agreement, Berlin itself was completely surrounded by Soviet territory. The idea was if you split Germany up into little sections, Germany wouldn't have the power or the strength to be able to start yet another war. So the creation of the administrative zones was there to have a bridging gap for the German people. It worked in the sense that the western part of Germany flourished and became the dominant economy in Europe within a matter of a decade. But America also had an important part to play in rebuilding war-torn Europe. The US was at that time the only major economy that had not been significantly damaged by the war. Under the so-called Marshall Plan, it set out to remove European trade barriers, modernize its industry and make Europe prosperous again. The Marshall Plan was really a piece of quite enlightened self-interest to buy the loyalty of Western Europe by giving them these huge aid packages with the proviso that they all started cooperating with one another. America also hoped that by supporting the European economy, it would help stop the spread of Soviet communism, even though US Secretary of State George Marshall, who initiated the plan, denied that this was the case. Our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, desperation, and chaos. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the Soviet Union did not see it that way. It completely rejected the plan, describing it as dollar imperialism. And the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, started to exert ever tighter control over the Eastern Bloc countries such as Hungary, Poland and Czechoslovakia. The division of Europe into two halves was well and truly underway. The Marshall Plan ran for four years from 1947. During that time, America gave some 13 billion US dollars in aid to help the recovery in Western European countries. The Marshall Plan benefited the United States in terms of providing it with markets to trade with, in terms of expanding economic opportunities, and that clearly benefited the US economy. In 1948, the countries participating in the Marshall Plan officially came together to form the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. Most of those countries are members of the EU as it exists today. But as Western Europe began to take shape, so too did the Soviet bloc. The suggestion that these countries might be democracies rapidly disappeared, and the Soviet Union began to exert its influence. They were very cynical about the way they took power. One of the first things they did was to infiltrate all the print unions. That way they could control the media. If any of the newspapers wanted to, to publish a story which was anti-Soviet, all the print workers would go on strike. They also made sure they had control of the police forces, the armies, the justice system, and eventually this led to control of the government. Britain's wartime leader, Winston Churchill, coined a phrase that would famously describe the growing division of Europe. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Churchill had always been very sceptical about the Soviet Union and he coined this wonderful phrase, the Iron Curtain, which was coming down across Europe. This was really the first time that the idea that there would be a split in Europe was voiced by anybody. Stalin described Churchill's speech as a declaration of war and the phrase Iron Curtain was destined to become part of the English language. As the Cold War strengthened, it gained popularity as a convenient way of describing Europe's division. A 
At the same time, the relationship between Western Europe and the USA grew stronger. In 1949, the US formally aligned itself with Canada and its Western European allies to form the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Its member states agreed to a policy of mutual defense in response to any attack by an external party. The founding members established a transatlantic bridge between Western Europe and the United States, and that became the security guarantor for Western Europe in the face of Soviet threat throughout the Cold War. Stalin retaliated by creating a union with his Eastern Bloc allies, the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, or Comicon. And in the same year, the Soviets exploded their first atomic bomb. Startling headlines flood the American press following news of the atom explosion within the borders of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union detonated its nuclear device, it was not a huge surprise to the West because there was an awareness that the Soviet Union was working on its own uh, nuclear programs. But clearly, it brought about anxiety. Here you had a country which had a different view in the world, had an expansionist view in the world, and that created problems. Faced with a perceived growing threat from the Soviet Union, European leaders decided it was more important than ever to create some form of union. They began to create a series of treaties and agreements which ultimately led to the European Union as we know it today. Let's take a look at some of the key events along the way. The very first of those treaties dates back to 1944, even before World War II had ended. That was when the governments in exile of Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg agreed to form the Benelux Economic Union. It was designed to promote the free movement of workers, capital, services and goods throughout the member countries. It was to create a tighter economic bonds, as in the model of a customs union, which gets rid of, in effect, the tariff barriers between countries to allow goods to move more freely, to improve economic productivity, to try and create a tighter economic market to expand their economic well-being. The early success of the Benelux deal encouraged other countries to consider the benefits of political and economic union. On May the 9th, 1950, French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman presented a proposal for the creation of an organized Europe. It became known as the Schuman Declaration. He is regarded as one of the founding fathers of European unity, and in his honor, May 9th is still celebrated as Europe Day. Schuman's initiative led to the founding of the European Coal and Steel Community. This had six member states, the original Benelux countries, as well as France, Italy, and Western Germany. Then a few years later, in 1957, came the Treaty of Rome. This created the European Economic Community, EEC, or Common Market. The Treaty of Rome moved European integration on from coal and steel into other areas. And the view at the time was that integration would move forward into these these areas to bring the countries more closely together. The Soviet Union did not intend to be outdone by the West, so they formed a military alliance with their Eastern Bloc neighbors, the Warsaw Pact. Then on the 13th of August, 1961, the East Germans, under instructions from the Soviet Union, began work on a construction that would come to symbolize the Cold War. It was the Berlin Wall. The East German government gave explicit orders to shoot and kill attempted defectors. In the years that followed, over a hundred people were killed as they tried to escape to the West. In 1963, American President John F. Kennedy came to Berlin and made one of his most famous speeches. Today, in the world of freedom, the proudest boast is, Ich bin ein Berliner. Kennedy's speech was a great morale boost for West Berliners. They were living in an enclave deep inside East Germany, and they feared an East German occupation could happen at any time. But of course, morale was even lower on the other side of the wall. For nearly 30 years, with a few exceptions, the people of East Berlin would be prisoners. Back in the West, moves to create an economic union were gaining momentum. In 1973, six became nine when Denmark, Ireland and the United Kingdom formally entered the EEC. 1979 saw the first democratic elections to the European Parliament. 
Up until that stage, there was no opportunity for the citizens of the member states to cast a vote of influence on the decisions of Europe. It was all an indirect process. Then, in the early 1980s, Greece, Portugal and Spain also joined the EEC. The map of Europe stayed pretty much unchanged for many years. But in 1987, another American president, Ronald Reagan, came to Berlin to make a groundbreaking speech. In that speech, he issued a direct challenge to the Soviet General Secretary, Mikhail Gorbachev. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Two years later, on the 9th of November, 1989, Mikhail Gorbachev allowed Berliners to destroy the wall. The Soviet Union collapsed soon afterwards. This is Maastricht in the south of the Netherlands. You could say that this is the birthplace of the EU as we know it today, because it was here in 1992 that the Treaty on European Union was signed. The ending of the Cold War also brought about new challenges to Europe. This included the migrations of people across borders. There was a need to deal with new security threats as states which had previously been dealt with under the Soviet system suddenly began to fracture and fragment. How would Europe respond to these issues became big concerns of the Maastricht Treaty negotiations. The Maastricht Treaty was a major milestone on the road to economic and political integration. The treaty created unified foreign and security policy, as well as closer cooperation in justice and home affairs. And the name European Union came into being for the first time, replacing the earlier European community. In many ways, we can go back to sort of the, the visionaries of Europe who often talked about creating an ever closer union. So the name gave signification towards the fact that this was a closer body, more than just a community. The Maastricht Treaty also set out clear rules for the creation of a single currency. By making sure that everybody had the same currency, it first of all meant that people could trade much more easily between one another, but it also bound them together. The euro was really billed as the glue which would bind Europe together. And so, in 1999, 11 countries adopted the single currency, the euro. Euro notes and coins came into circulation three years later. Today, the euro is the currency for some 300 million Europeans. The European Union also has a unique political system. As we've already seen, there's the Parliament building here in Brussels. The Parliament is the directly elected body that represents the EU's citizens. But there's also a European Council, or Council of Ministers, that meets four times a year. And to complete what's known as the European Institutional Triangle, there's the European Commission. The Commission is best described as the EU's executive arm and is answerable to the Parliament. Its job is on the one hand to administer policies, but on the other hand, the European Commission isn't just about policy administration and management of policies, it's also about policy initiation. The European Court of Justice is located in Luxembourg. It is made up of one judge from each EU country. The court's role is to ensure that EU law is complied with and that the treaties are correctly interpreted and applied. Meanwhile, the European Central Bank in Frankfurt is responsible for monetary policy in all the Eurozone countries. The bank is independent of national governments and it has a mandate to keep inflation under control. Many of the EU countries have taken integration a step further. They're the countries that signed up to the Schengen Agreement to do away with passport checks and border controls. Some 400 million people live within the Schengen area. The extent to which the Schengen Agreement has worked will depend upon your viewpoint. If you are from the camp which suggests that European integration should allow free movement of people, should not be controlled, should not have borders, etc., then it's a perfect system. If your view is that that's problematic, that actually we want to have a degree of control, visa entries, etc., then you're against that. 
But what the Schengen system has done is it has established structures to allow this sort of movement. The European Union flag is recognized throughout the world. It was designed to signify Europe's unity and common identity. There are 12 stars, not because of the number of countries involved, but because the number 12 is traditionally the symbol of perfection, completeness and unity. And the fact that they form a circle is supposed to represent solidarity and harmony between the peoples of Europe. The European Union is not perfect. When governing so many people from different backgrounds and cultures, problems inevitably arise. And no fewer than 23 official languages are spoken by the EU citizens. Some countries would like to join the EU. At the same time, politicians in many member countries would like their governments to leave the EU. Although the size and shape of the EU is very likely to change, it remains to be seen whether Europe will ever be fully unified. People in all the individual countries of Europe still love their countries. They don't want to be merely Europeans. They all have their own national identities. So I don't think we'll ever see a, a case where Europe is just one United States of Europe. In 50 years time, I believe the European Union will exist, but I don't believe it will exist in a tightly integrated market. I think that we will potentially go back towards Europe having a closer focus upon trade and economic benefits in terms of movement of goods, etc. The EU's population is around half a billion strong, making it the world's third largest after China and India. And although it is less than half the size of the US, Europe's population is over 50% larger. And Europe's combined GDP is also greater than that of the United States. Its economic output is now nearly a third of the world's total. The EU collectively is the world's largest exporter of goods. I don't think that anybody back in 1945 could possibly have imagined the EU that we have today. Europe had just undergone such a horrendous war that the idea that they could all come together in one place and so peacefully discuss things like trade and bureaucracy and even argue with one another is something that was probably beyond their imaginations in the aftermath of the Second World War. What Europe will do is it will help to promote peace and stability and security in the countries that are part of it. And that is a significant success. The European Union has its origins in a peace initiative that started after World War II. But look at the Europe of today and you will see that it has become so much more.